We're going to use two scriptures today. And we're continuing with this lifting up message. Our first scripture today is John 3, 14 and 15. Now, to put this into context, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is one of the Pharisees, one of the lawmakers. But he really sees that there's something there. He's one of the few that really sees that, that and feels there's something to this. So he wants to know. And Jesus is teaching him. Now, you know, one of the most poignant things that I learned getting into the ministry was I was amazed how I didn't realize until I started studying it how much Jesus uses the Old Testament. You know, there used to be a time uh, in the Christian church where you know, like back in the, when the good news for modern man came out and all those things, they were just giving out New Testaments and they were saying, well, the Old Testament's been preceded. You know, it's, 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 or been superseded. It's, the Old Testament's really cool and it's, it's, but it's about the Jews and we don't really need it. Well, that's not true at all. You have to study the Old Testament just as much because Jesus is constantly using it. And here's a perfect example. Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Now what is He referencing there? Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, our second scripture today is Numbers 21 Four through nine. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route. The, 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 excuse me. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and Moses and said, "Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert?" There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Manna was gross. It was. It kept you alive, but it was gross. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the, for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Blessed be the word of God. You know, that story used to just kind of just go right over my head. But the thing is, is you have to realize something else that may have gone unnoticed or, or nothing thought of it. You ever notice on medical things, the symbol are intertwined snakes around a pole? Why is that? Well, we have one example here. The cool thing is, is it's referenced in several cultures. The medical symbol of a snake. God telling Moses to use it as a symbol for cure and a symbol for the poison. But why? My first question was, why would you use the same? Now, if, if you were wanting to, you know, if, 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 I guess if maybe you looked at the South American or the Mexican view of it, since it's on their flag, you, you would have, you would tell Moses, man, put an eagle on a pole, and if you get bitten by this snake, the eagle will eat the snake and take care of you. No. He's wanting, why use the exact same symbol? The answer is really pretty simple. Because God redeems. 
That's the word of today, redeem. God redeems. God uses evil and has the capacity to use evil for his own purpose. These two scripts are what you call a salvation text, a way of being saved. But the script is flipped. Philip Yancey wrote an article in one of his books I want to reference. And it's got a quote in it by Dallas Willard. I, I know you've heard Don mention both people a lot. I, I know because over the years he's given me all the Yancey books and all the Dallas Willard books and all this stuff. Uh, but he writes, I was once part of a small group with a Christian leader whose name you would likely recognize. He went through a hard time as his adult children got into trouble, bringing him sleepless nights and expensive attorney fees. And you know what? And I'm going to say it in front of mixed company. I've... All my life I've said one thing, the worst kids in the world are preacher's kids and cop's kids. The worst children in the world, preacher's kids and cop's kids. Plus, my friend was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. Nothing in his life seemed to work out. I have no problem believing in God, he said to us one night. My question is, what's God good for? We listened to his complaints and tried various responses, but he batted them all away. A few weeks later, I came across a little phrase by Dallas Willard. For those who love God, nothing irredeemable can happen to you. I went back to my friend. What about that, I asked. Is God good for that promise? One of my favorite songs goes by the wrong name. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's not the name of the song, by the way. The name of the song is Heavenly Vision. But it's one of those things where it got changed over time. But turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. You know, God's wisdom is truth. And God's wisdom makes the wisdom of man foolishness. We can never be that smart. And if you try to, it's the old original sin thing. If you try to attain that level, you're just, it's going to be taken away. God's wisdom is salvation and redemption through Jesus who was lifted up for us to do one thing, turn our eyes to. Turn your eyes. If snakes are on the ground biting and killing, then the problem is the snakes. They need to be cleaned and redeemed. And then held up for the afflicted to see and believe, and they too can be cured of the poison. If the people of earth are biting and killing each other, or are in misery due to spiritual sickness and poisoning, then the problem is the people, us. We need to be cleaned and redeemed. However, our salvation is assured by the death and resurrection of the very one that came among us to show us the way to God's kingdom. The very one. If God can use a snake to redeem the very snake that is the evil, then God's use of the evil of the world, directed at and dominated by Jesus, to redeem us by turning our eyes upon the lifted up Christ, that's absolute. That salvation is absolute. And if we believe enough in Him to look up to Him, 
to look at the lifted up Jesus fully in the face, blood, scars, and all, then we believe enough to be saved. Absolutely. So that's why the lifted up message is so important. But what is your bronze snake? Everybody's got a bronze snake. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Then turn your eyes inward. And look full into your soul. Is there a hindrance there that is preventing you from looking fully to a lifted up Jesus? Or are you just squinting at him? Are you just like the old, you know, whenever my, my brother, older brother used to make me watch all these scary stuff on TV. And I learned how to watch it like this. <laughs> because as soon as something came into the camera, I could close that real quick. I could close that faster than I closed my eye. So I, are you looking at Jesus like that? I mean, think about it. Are you? Are you just squinting at him? Are you just casting him an occasional glance? Because you can't look at him because it makes you too uneasy? Ah, there's the problem. When you can look fully in the face of Jesus then you can look fully at yourself. And remember, the problem in the two scriptures are the snakes and the people. And they are us. But either way, redemption is assured if we look up to Jesus lifted up. And that can be difficult. The crucifix and the cross are graphic violent symbols of Christianity. Some people cringe at the sight of some of the crucifixes and some of the statues in some churches. As a matter of fact, there's a beautiful array of crosses there. There's not the body of the Lord on one of those, I don't think. I can't... Because we've gotten away from that. I was heavily influenced by the Catholic Church. I, I feel very close attraction, uh, uh, attachment to the Catholic Church from way back. We are all Catholic, but well, that's another sermon. Um, that's another sermon that I would not get away with. In this, I, anyway. Go into one of their churches and see the bloody, scarred remains that are hanging on that cross. And a lot of people say, that's, that's, no, that's not necessary. You know, when the movie, uh, the, 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 oh my goodness, I forgot the name, the Mel Gibson movie about, huh? The Passion. The Passion. When that came out, how many people said it's just too gross? There's no sense in showing that. Well, my dad had a comment about that. He says, you know, it reminds me of Saving Private Ryan, which one of its same thing, too, was that's just too graphic. That's just too real. Well, my dad said it should be. He said because I know it was worse than that, and people need to know that. Well, Jesus hanging on the cross was worse than that, and people need to know that. You know, I don't like to look at snakes either. I don't like snakes. My, and my grandmother instilled that in me. I grew up on a street on North End of Lexington where Mama and Papa all lived two houses down and across from us. And I, I was always down there, you know, doing stuff. And I was down there one beautiful summer day playing in the front yard. And Mama starts screaming on the porch and runs down and grabs me and holds me real tight because she looks over and there's a little bitty old poor garter snake in the front yard. And <laughs> snakes freaked her out. Well, Mama heard the screaming, looked down the street, saw her holding me and come a-running. And she says, what happened? What happened? Was looking at me. She goes, there's a snake. She goes, you're kidding. And went over and she just stomped the life out of that poor little snake, just in anger. <laughs> so I don't like snakes either, but 
when I've been incapacitated and rolling into a hospital or an ambulance, I sure do like the sign of that intertwined snake on that pole. That sure does comfort me knowing that I'm going to the right place. I want to refer to another article by Henry Nowen. The cross reveals the world we have and the God we have. Now, our, uh, Henry Nowen tells a story of a family he knew in Paraguay. The father, a doctor, spoke out against the military regime there and its human rights abuses. Local police took their revenge on him by arresting his teenage son, of Jesus, his being lifted up is comfort to those who know God. It's not gross. It doesn't make me uneasy. It's comforting. To ease our pain, to receive the salvation from the poison of the world, we need but to look up and turn our eyes upon Jesus. Believe it. Believe it. I hesitate a lot of time using personal stories, but Don said, you need to do it this time. Believe it. You know, I asked you earlier, what's your bronze snake? What is the very thing that's poisoning you or a hindrance to your spiritual relationship with God that can be made into a bronze thing and held up the very thing that can be lifted up to save you out of yourself. For me, it was just absolute, pure giving up on life. God prepared me. You know what, when I first got out, I'm going to take it all the way back. When I first got out of, of, of college, or I mean, of high school, was headed to college, I was playing football and things were great. And, you know, you just got the, the, the teenage hormones raging. And that's why all these boys get, they need to lay off of some of these kids because they, they, they get on them when they get in trouble and they forget that they're 18 years old. They're full of hormones and raging, uh, athletic uh, exertion and they do stupid things. So my call to the ministry got put on the back burner and then I got married and then it got pushed back a little bit. Still there, but I'll have to, you know, establish things. Then it started having children. It got pushed back even further and then it became not even on the back burner, it was under the stove. But God kept poking and poking, going, I need you. I want you. You need to come. You need to come. You need to believe. Believing wasn't important anymore. I had a job. I had a family. Things were going good. We had house, cars, paychecks. But it was empty. Everything I did, 
I did well, but it was so empty. So I looked at the wrong things. Those poisonous snakes start crawling in, and I've got nothing against a beer every now and then or some wine or even a drink of anything in moderation, but when you let it get out of control, the snake store is all around. You can go buy snakes, and they will attack you and poison you, and you drift further and further away. So after I lost my wife and my house, and the kids were grown and married, and I lost my health, and it all crashed down, and in the middle of the mountain parkway, I begged God to either let me go, because I could barely move, I could barely walk, to either let me go, or finally, if you could still use me, use me because I've got nothing. I've got nothing. Everything's wiped clean. Because if God wants you, he's going to get you. And if he's got to take it all away, he will. My point is, don't let that happen. Don't let it go that far. Don't be an idiot like me. Look up. Let God, you know, last week the message was about the cleaning out the temple. My message then last week at, at, uh, at another church was let God, let Jesus come in and, and throw that stuff out. Let him come in and wreak havoc. He's a sword. He's not there to pat you on the back and rub you on the head. He's there to rip all that out of you and get your life back on track. And that's what you have to let him do. Let him take whatever it is. That's keeping you back. That's holding you back that little bit. That make, the, make that total commitment. Whatever it is, let him take that out and put it on a pole and lift that up so that you can see that and the very thing that's keeping you down is going to save you. Because it's lifted up. It's redeemed. That snake was redeemed. If the solution in numbers was a snake raised up on a pole because the problem was poisonous serpents on the ground, so in John, if the solution is a human, the Word made flesh, on a pole, again, the problem is the human on the ground, us. My problem, what I was going through my redemption, my problem was me. It wasn't my ex-wife. It wasn't anything else. It wasn't the, the job, though I used it as an excuse. It was me. It was me not turning my eyes and fully looking at Jesus, even though I was raised in the church. I was expected to go into the ministry because of all the work I did as a teenager and in college. And I let me down. I let me down. I don't let God down. I let me down. Don't let yourself down. Look at what's in there. Our problem is, and my problem it was and still is, is that we are human. And this doesn't go away. This is something you have to keep fighting. It doesn't just change. You go, ooh, I'm done with that. No. It's a total battle. Our problem is that we are human. So a human being had to be lifted up on a pole. But Christ's divinity makes the effect last for eternity. And we might look at him and live as the ancient Israelites looked to the serpent on the pole and were cured from the poisonous bites. Charlie Brown and Lucy. Lucy once said to Charlie Brown, discouraged again, hey, Charlie Brown, you know what your whole trouble is? The whole trouble with you is that you're you. And Charlie Brown asked, well, what in the world can I do about that? Lucy answers, hey, I don't pretend to be able to give advice. I nearly point out the problem. <laughs> the symbol of Jesus on a pole indicates that the problem with us is us. And that Jesus lifted up is the solution. However, another conversation by Lucy and Charlie Brown indicates another part of the problem or solution Lucy speaks. 
You know what the whole trouble with you is, Charlie Brown? And Charlie Brown answers, no, and I don't want to know. Leave me alone. And he walks away. Lucy shouts after him, the whole trouble with you is you won't listen to what the whole trouble with you is. And we don't. The solution begins with listening. Now, if you are the problem, you can't be the solution. So if you're going to do self-help, I'm sorry. This ain't self-help. This ain't self-help. This is lifting up on a pole to be redeemed. And you can't do that on your own. The solution comes from outside yourself. Yet the solution is inside. We are the problem. In Numbers, we aren't told if the poisonous snakes disappeared. Only that God provided a way for those who had been bitten by the serpents to live. By analogy, Jesus being lifted up, exalted on a cross, doesn't take away from our human sinfulness. But through Him, through Jesus Christ, lifted up, God provides a way for those bitten by sin to live eternally. That's the best news you could ever hear. As deep cries out